according to your will. According to your will. My life is not my own. Welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk as we continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. It's been a blessing because it's the Word of God and the Word of God is always a blessing. Amen. 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 amen and Amen. This has been a great study. Great study. Right. You know, we usually give thanks before we eat. Um, mm -hmm. So I will give thanks, Father. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father, for, thank for your you, Word, Jesus. which we yes. can feast on, Lord God. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You wrote that. So we re just rejoice in that. Yes, Jeremiah said, Thy word was found, and I ate it. So, Father, we give you thanks in the name of your Son, Jesus, for the meal on your word, the feast of your word that we're about to have. Lord, let it just all be your word. Speak to us through the ministering of your Holy Spirit, Lord God. We just praise you and thank you for sending your Spirit to lead us into all truth. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in chapter 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. We've been studying the Sermon on the Mount for six months now. Um, from Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So where we left off uh, last time in Matthew 7, verse 11. So we'll pick it up in Matthew 7, 12 right now. Uh, and I, I, before we do, I just want to remind you, you know, if you had a conversation with somebody and they sat there and they, or stood there and talked to you for five minutes mm -hmm. and talked about 8,000 different subjects, you know, going from one to the other, from one to the other, one to the other, you might, might have trouble following it. You may think this person's a little batso. Uh, but some, sometimes that's how we treat the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Because we treat it as, you know, a whole bunch of separate verses where it is a single message that Christ is giving it's to His apostles and disciples. It's yeah. one teaching. Yeah. And we have to see the connection between the verses. We have to understand the flow of this. Because our God is not a God of confusion. He's a God, he is a God of good order. And there's good order to this. So there's connection between all of this. Alright? So reading from Matthew 7.12. In everything, therefore. Therefore. You see, because of what's going before. He's saying, because of all of this. Now, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Now, I, a lot of this and a lot of scripture is about our relationship with other people. You know, and I've said oftentimes that spirituality, true spirituality, empowered by the Holy Spirit within you, mm -hmm. is your relationship with God. Whereas religion is basically not your relationship with God, your relationship with other people. All right? The church is, is religion. It's your relationship with people. Mm -hmm. But that depends on the foundation of your relationship with the Lord. Okay? So, if you look at the minor prophets in the Old Testament, you will see them talking about the injustice of society. But I will tell you that I don't believe in a social gospel. That said, I believe that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, must impact our relationship with the society we live in. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah, right. The gospel, the good news, is about Christ restoring us to a right relationship with God the Father. Mm -hmm. Based on that, you can now have a right relationship with people. Exactly. And without the one, you can't have the other. Yeah, uh, right. I'll, I'll tell you. Either way. Because if you don't have a right relationship with the Father, you have nothing to support a right relationship with, with people. anybody else. But by the same token, what Jesus has taught and what he's teaching here is if you don't have a right relationship, you're not going to have a right relationship with people. You'll not have a right relationship with him. That's right. I'm sure you have heard Jesus saying, what, whatever you've done to the least of my brethren, you've done unto me. Do unto others as right? you have them do it. So, yeah. you know, you can't say you have a great relationship with the Lord and don't have a great relationship with people. A right relationship with mm -hmm. people, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I kind of grew up in the faith when I first got saved uh, around a, a group of people, very nice people, uh, monks as they were, mm. who were very involved in liberation theology and a, and a social gospel, particularly in third world countries and in, in the Far East and in 
uh, Latin America. And, and I believe, you know, that has a place, but that place follows the good news of the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Not for nothing did the Apostle Paul say, I have determined to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified, because that's the foundation of all relationships. Well, wouldn't that be good works? Well, it is. And I'm glad you said that, because remember, in the beginning of this sermon, and I'm saying this is a connectivity, right. Jesus said that we're supposed to do good works, exactly. but we're supposed to do them in such a way as people see our works and glorify God, God not, me. not us, all right? Mm -hmm. So, here in this teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke of the blessings that are ours when we are gentle, when we're merciful, when we're peacemakers, when we forgive others, when we are the light of the world, when we are the salt of the earth, when we treat others as we should. Remember, I, I've said that's the Beatitudes, right? Yes. So, I, and I've said this, basically Jesus, the first thing he starts the Sermon on the Mount with is the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. And all the rest is kind of commentary on mm -hmm. that, or an expounding and an expansion of that. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's doing here. All right, because when you are, when you are merciful, mm -hmm. when you're gentle, when you're a peacemaker, when you're forgiving, that's going to give you a right relationship with people. All right? Absolutely. Because when we treat others as we should, that's treating them with grace. It's not treating them based on what they deserve. Mm -hmm. Thank God I don't get what I deserve. Yes. You now people ask me how I am, I say I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm blessed. blessed. Much more than I deserve. Because I don't deserve anything. That's a fact. I mean, I see, you know, you can't turn on the television, the telly anymore, and you see some advertisement for a shampoo or something because you deserve it. You don't deserve anything. The only thing you deserve, because it says the wages of sin are death, is death. Don't get what you deserve. Get the grace of God. But then, having received the grace of God, we are supposed to be gracious. That's right. Because He has forgiven us, we're supposed to forgive. Because He has loved us, we're supposed to love others. Because He's been graceful to us, we are supposed to be gracious to others. Whatever He's done for us, we need to do for others. Yeah, but it's sad to see, I, you know, my experience has been, oftentimes in the church, that, that people I meet, particularly in ministry, are less gracious than people Absolutely. I've met in the world, in the business world. And that's, that's a sad, sad commentary. So, so think about that. Your, your right relationship with other people, treating others as you would have them treat you, mm -hmm. is based on your understanding of the grace that you receive and the grace that you now give. All right? Paul wrote to the Colossians, Colossians 3.23, and he said, whatever you do, do it heartily, as unto the Lord and not to men. So when you're doing these things, you are, as I said before, Jesus said, whatever you do, the least of my brethren you've done to me. Whatever you're doing, do it as unto the Lord. And if you start, that starts to become your attitude. I promise you, it will change the way you deal with people, right? Is there a proverb that says, whatever you put your hand to, or is that somewhere else? No, that's in Ecclesiastes. Whatever you put your hand, whatever you find to put your hand to, do with all of your mind. And that's what he means by do it heartily. Right. I mean, do it. We're, we're supposed to be everything that you have. With everything you have, we're supposed to be enthusiastic. You know, I, I've met people, and they they say one way or the other. Uh, you know, you're really enthusiastic about the gospel. Well, we're we're all supposed to be enthusiastic. And and by the way, only the saved can truly be enthusiastic. Right. And when you see unsaved people who look enthusiastic, what you are seeing is a poor imitation. Right. Because enthusiasm comes from the Greek, mm -hmm. entheos. It literally means to have God in, in you. you. We are, those of us who have accepted the atoning work of Jesus, we are the temple of the living God, yeah. the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right. We have God in us. Right. Our life should be enthusiastic. Hallelujah. And if it's not, well, that's why Paul says, let a man examine himself. We need to examine ourselves and see what's going wrong here. Because that should be our life, is a life of enthusiasm, doing all things heartily. Whatever you find your hand to, do with all your might. Right? Our purpose in doing all of this, and what Jesus is talking about, is to bring God's love, to bring His light, to bring His grace, to bring His power into a world that's darkened by sin. Okay? That's, again, Paul writing to the, to the Corinthians, mm -hmm. saying, you know, what our ministry is, that we are a fragrant aroma bringing the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. That's our job, is to bring the knowledge of Jesus Christ into every place. 
So this requires not only treating others as we want them to treat us, but treating them as we have been treated. Right. This is how you learn to, to how to treat this others. This is training. Well, well, it is, but I mean, we learn from what God has done with us. Right. It says, we know love by this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He, he gave his love for us when we were absolutely undeserving of his love. And that has to be the instruction. And remember, the goal of our instruction, Paul wrote to Timothy, is love. That has to be the instruction for everything that we're doing about our relationship with others. It's not about giving them what they deserve, especially what you think they deserve. And again, judge not, lest you be judged. Take the, take the speck out of your, before you take the speck out of your brother's eye, take the lie out. Yeah. This is all, you see, these are not separate verses. These all lock together, all right? Yeah. All right. So we've been forgiven. We are to forgive. Mm -hmm. We have the power to do that because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. as Paul wrote to the Romans, chapter 5. And as he wrote to Corinth, love does not take into account a wrong, a wrong suffered. suffered. And love never fails. Mm -mm. Right? That's the law and the prophets. That's the whole revelation of God. Mm -hmm. Because the law and the prophets, as it's being used, that's from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It is the revelation of God. The law and the prophets encompasses everything. As Jesus encompasses everything. He is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Mm -hmm. There's nothing outside of that. There's nothing outside of the Law and the Prophets. Because all of the Law and the Prophets, the spirit of prophecy is a testimony of Jesus Christ. Right? Yes. The Law is a tutor that leads you to Christ. This is the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Everything points to Jesus Christ. When Peter writes that we have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness, it's because there's nothing outside of the Law and the Prophets. Right. There's nothing that you need outside of Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It is all revealed in there. Because what is revealed in there is Jesus Christ. And you know what you need? You need Jesus Christ. Um, the Law and the Prophets encompass everything, all, on how we are to live. Remembering this message, as we often noted before, this message is directed to believers. Amen. Okay? Jesus was speaking the Sermon on the Mount to his, to his disciples. He had just named the apostles. So this, listen, it, there may have been unbelievers standing there listening. Indeed, there, there were. I mean, that's evident from the Gospels. But he is speaking to his disciples. All right? I have a, a brother in New York. I don't know how many times, or in Florida rather. I don't know how many times I've said this to him. Because he comes and he talks about how people behave out in the world. I said, do not. Expect righteous. Do not expect righteous behavior from unrighteous people. Mm -hmm. It's tough enough to get righteous behavior from righteous people. That's right. Right? So, so understand when we're talking about this. God is instructing you to love others as you would have, or treat others as you would have them treat you. Don't expect them to treat you like you want. They don't right? know any better. They don't, right? Okay. This encompasses everything, as I said, okay? The assumption is, because it's directed to believers, that we already love God. Yes. Okay? Because if you've been saved, you declared Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and He brought you back into that right relationship with the Father. Right? right? So, remember, the great commandment is called Shema in, in Israel. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim. This is Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Yeah. Alright? And, but in the New Testament, a man came to Jesus Christ, right? And I'm going to read to you from Matthew 22, verses 36 and 40, through 40. A man came to Jesus and said, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And he went on to say, The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Everything is wrapped up in this commandment. All right. Mm. Keeping this will fulfill what, what James 
calls in his letter the royal law of law. Right? That's that's what it boils down to. Is James two eight? He talks about the royal law, law of love. So the connection to the to the next verses is that most people, all of whom you are to love, will not be lovable. That's right. God understands that. Mm -hmm. Trust me on this. Trust me on this. In the eyes of God, I mean, you were not in a natural lovable to God when Jesus Christ went to the cross because He loves you. It says that there, in Proverbs chapter 6, it says that six things, there are six things, yea, even seven, that are an abomination to the Lord. You know what an abomination is? I mean, it's like coming across something that gags you. Well, we had those sins in our life. And yet, God the Father sent Jesus Christ because of His love for us, for God so loved the world, to die for us for those, in spite of those sins, right? So, the connection to the next verses is that most people all of whom we are to love, will not be lovable, at least in the natural. Remember that Jesus had just said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Right? I mean, this is all, you've got to understand, this is all connected. It's not a whole bunch of separate verses. And I mean, 99% of the time you hear anything from the Sermon on the Mount, it's this verse or that verse or this verse or that verse, which is, I mean, that's all right, but you have to understand that it's, there's a connection between these. So in verse 13 and 14, I'm going to read that from Matthew chapter 7 now. It says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. All right? Mm -hmm. This is what Jesus taught. Now, if you're a Bible believer, let, let, you see, I take Jesus at his word, Amen. which is always a good thing to do, by the way. Right? Mm -hmm. In the broad spectrum of life, the majority will be made up of people who have chosen the way that leads to destruction. And it will only be a minority who have chosen to enter the way that leads to life. Mm -hmm. well, that's what it says. That's what, it, not it, that's what Jesus just got through saying, right? Are we Bible believers? I mean, do we actually believe what he's saying? Yes. That, the, that many versus few, the majority versus the minority, many of those who are going to choose the way to... What is the way? Jesus Christ, John 14, 6, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. There's only one way. There's only one road. There's only one gate. There's only one path. And that is Jesus Christ. And the majority of people... Now listen, this is not God's will that the majority of people reject him. Peter wrote and says that God's, it's his heart that none should perish. Jesus Christ died. John the Baptist, when he saw him coming at the baptism, remember? He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ went to the cross for every human being that ever lived. But, it says, so whosoever wills, it's a matter of free will. It's a matter of choice. And in spite of God's desire, because, you know, I have said this a few times during this study, it is an amazing thing that an almighty, all-powerful God to whom nothing is impossible has given us the power to say no to Him. I, I don't quite understand that. I mean, I don't understand, I, but that's, He's given us that choice. It says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua said, but as for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. You have a choice. He said, I set before you life and death. Choose life. It's a matter of the choice. It's free will. And what Jesus is saying is the reality. And when I promise you, when Jesus speaks it, it is reality. Right. He said, the majority of people are going to reject this. The majority of people are going to choose that broad, easy way that leads to destruction. When you were talking about Jesus being the way, because um, this scripture says, the way is broad that leads to destruction, right. and the way is narrow that leads to life. Right. And I was just thinking about how Satan is an imitator. He tries to imitate right. God. So he is also the way. But he, he is the, the way, way to destruction. destruction. Right, yes. Yes. Right. So now, if we've got this, that uh, the majority are going the wrong way and the minority are going the right way, that would be kind of a poor advert for democracy. Mm. You have to be careful about 
being led by choices made by the majority, That's right. by the many. I mean, is that simple logic? If, if Jesus has made a statement, and God, let me tell you, he watches over his word to perform it, yes, right? Yes. It says, in John chapter 10, it says, his word cannot be broken. There's no marketing plan you can come up with. There's no program your church can come up with to change this fact. No. All right? So, be careful about following the majority. Do you think this is something new? In Exodus 32, or Exodus 23, verse 2, rather, God spoke, and it says this, You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. I mean, it's a simple fact. It's a simple fact. That, listen, I'm old enough to have had an, at least a, a certain amount of experience in watching this. Watch out for mob rule. Watch out for when things are, really... I mean, it's like a mentality happens when you get a whole bunch of people together who are not thinking for themselves, but are being led, driven, driven by, by a mob, by, by a majority. It's insanity. My mommy, my mommy, my mother used to say to me when I was a little kid, she said, well, if your friends jumped off the Empire State mm -hmm. Building, would you jump off too? Well, I always said no to her, but that was a lie. <laughs> Because the fact of the matter is, if my friends jumped off the Empire State Building, I'm probably going to go right You know why? Because I'm a lemming. Yes. As a follower okay. at the time. Well, because, you want to know something? You just get caught that up That is fallen human yeah. nature, is to follow the crowd. It is man's nature to follow the crowd, right. to be afraid to step it's outside. Yeah. Because when you step outside... You, you don't know, fit in. Well, but, but think about this. See, because we've seen this in a, in a natural, right? Satan goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Mm -hmm. Did you ever watch the Discovery Channel? Yes. Watch, watch Africa. Yeah. You know, and when lions attack a herd of animals, because the weakest, they go for the one who is separate mm -hmm. from the majority. Now, in the in the natural world, in the animal world, that tends to be the weakest, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But they go after the one who has separated from the crowd. That's right. Let me tell you something. You know, it's Paul wrote in Romans, in, in the first chapter, and talks about how God reveals himself through what he has created, through nature. Yes, yes. I'm telling you, Satan goes after the one who steps out from the crowd. Mm. Now, he may perceive it because that's as being weakness. But I'm going to tell you, it is the strong Christian who step steps away from the crowd. That's right. And it is the strong Christian who, when he steps out from the crowd and is attacked by that lion, you know what? The, that lion, that that goes about as a roaring lion. Right. He's the one who better watch out. Yeah. Not you, all right? Again, that yeah. imitation, as a yeah. roaring lion. As, it's an imitation. The lion right. of yes. Judah. Yeah, so. yes. All right. But I, I, if you're familiar with lemmings, I mentioned lemmings. Lemmings are little animals. Yeah. Not the sour fruit that you eat. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> And what happens is they, I don't know, I don't, I never really studied this, but like one lemming goes over the cliff and all the lemmings go over the cliff. But that's the way we are in nature. Because it's peer pressure. Yes. And trust me, peer pressure is pressure indeed. Yes, it is. Okay? And the crazy thing about peer pressure is, and you can see this in any mall in America, any town center in the UK, these all these young people they want to be different, different and, they're all and they all the look same. exactly the same. I mean, it's like stamp, stamp, rubber stamp, rubber stamp. They all look identical because they want to be different. Mm -hmm. Hello, it's peer pressure. Solomon Ash was a psychologist at Swarthmore College in the United States mm -hmm. who pioneered in social psychology. He conducted experiments in the 50s showing the power of peer pressure. The subjects, he would gather these subjects in the college, right? As part of a larger, larger group in an experiment. And they were asked to answer a simple question. They were shown, in the first one that was done, they were shown a, a card with three lines of very, very distinct sizes. Okay. And then they were shown another card with one line. And they said, okay, which line in that picture does this match? Mm -hmm. And it was very, very obvious which one it matched. Right. So there's ten people there. And the first one says, well, it's line number three. Mm -hmm. And the second one says, yeah, it's line number three. And the third one says, now it's not line number three. Because what's going on is the first nine people are part of the experiment, but the last person doesn't realize that. 
right? And though they're giving an incorrect, an obviously incorrect right answer, answer, it gets down to that tenth person, and now he has a choice of being different from the first nine and answering the question correctly, which is obvious, or he can follow the nine and answer incorrectly. Invariably, almost always, he'll answer according to what the first nine has said. It's peer pressure. Now, actually, this guy started out with this experiment to show, to disprove peer pressure. Ah, okay. And he was shocked at the results, and this experiment has been duplicated hundreds oh, of times, oh, yeah. and the results are always, always yeah. consistent. Yeah. It's astounding. Another one that I, I read about years ago, um, I think it was at Yale University, and they took a group of ten people in the same situation. One of the ten is the actual subject, right? right? He doesn't know that. Yeah. He thinks all ten are doing the same experiment. Right. Right. And they're standing in front of a wall that is, let's say, bright green. Mm -hmm. And the, what's explained is this is a vision test about color perception. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, what we want you to do is pretend you just go down the line and say, well, okay, what color do you see? Now remember, this is a bright green wall. And the first guy says, it was, it's blue. Second guy says it's blue. And they go down the line. One, two, three, four, five. Nine people say blue. And the tenth person looks at that wall. He knows it's green. But nine people before him have said it's blue. Almost always, he'll say blue. blue. <laughs> it's peer pressure. And peer pressure is a phenomenally strong power to the unsaved. Yes. It should not be a power or a pressure to us because the Word of God says we're not to imitate those first nine people. We're not supposed to imitate the crowd. We're not supposed to be a lemming in the pack. Follow we're not supposed to follow our friends over the edge of the Empire State Building. It says, therefore, we are to be imitators of God, therefore, beloved children. The Apostle Paul said, listen, he said, be an imitator of me even as I am of Christ. We've got to wipe that peer pressure trying to be conformed to the world. Trying to be like the world. You know why you do that? Because you want to please them. Yes. You want to please them. You know, Paul said this, if I was trying to please men, I couldn't please God. That's right. It takes that conviction inside of you, that commitment from you, to say, I am willing to stand out and be a target. Mm -hmm. All right? There was one other that I wanted to mention, because in 1961, this was, I, I thought, really important. This, there was a, another professor, Stanley Milburn, and this was uh, at, at Yale University, as I recall. He started experiments to determine people's willingness to obey instructions of authority oh, figures. Right. Yes. Okay, that required them to perform deeds that would absolutely be in, against their normal behavior right. or ethics, right? And what they were doing, while we're not going through the whole thing, is that uh, he, he would put one person in a room and wire them up to uh, electrodes. Mm -hmm. And they're the test subject, and there's one more test subject. And the, the, the test subject that's actually being tested is told if the person gives an incorrect answer, you give them a little electric shock. They're trying to see if they can motivate people to be more conscious and correct in their, in their answers. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the guy who is the authority figure, who's got the lab coat and the, the board, right. keeps telling him to increase the power of the shot right. until the people say, well, they start hollering and they say, well, then stop. Yeah. And they finally get to the place where they, they absolutely say, stop the experiment now, stop. And they, the experiment tour, the guy, the lab guy, says, no, give him another shot and make it more. Well. You would think anybody, anybody with any ethics, anybody with any morals, anybody with any conscience is going to say, no, I don't care. But the fact of the matter was that person after person after person in the majority of people, and every time this experiment has been replicated, they will give that shock rather than disobey that experiment, mm -hmm. the authority figure. And you know what? It started because Milgram got this idea at the time of the, the Nuremberg trials oh, right. yeah. when all of these Nazis we're talking about how, you know, these guys had done things they would never normally have done. But it was because of the authority. Because it was the authority. You know why? Because you will serve somebody. Yes. And if you are not yes. serving the Lord, yes. oh, what a horrible person you're going to serve. That's right. Connect this back. 
Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You will love the one and hate the other. I'm and telling the masters you, are good and evil. You, they are. And that's what it boils down to. That's yes. Right. Yes, it's good and evil. But you have to choose to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life that's in reality right. and in practice. To get the strength of the Holy Spirit working within you. The power of the Holy Ghost within you. Mm -hmm. To be able to resist these temptations and horrors from the devil. Because I tell you, the afflictions of the righteous are many. They're going to come upon you. And Satan will be attacking you. He will. But you do have the power. You do have the strength. You do have that Holy Ghost within you to give you the power to resist evil. Mm -hmm. And that's what it says. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Humble yourself. Submit to God. Sub resist the devil and he will flee from you. We can't lean on our own no. understanding. But I'm going to tell you don't. something. We don't have the power. With, you do not have the power within yourself to resist the devil. No, not at all. And God knows that. Yes. So He's given you power. Yes. Hallelujah. That's what Holy Jesus said. Power. Jesus said, "I've given you power. I've given That's you right. authority to tread Amen. on the serpent." Amen. Yes. Okay. Okay. But pe you got to understand, people who are unsaved, unregenerate, are lemmings. They are. They're good lemmings. Or to put it as the Lord did, speaking through Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Every man is stupid and devoid of knowledge. That's Jeremiah 10, 14. Well, that's pretty harsh. <laughs> you betcha it is. <laughs> but Jesus Christ spoke the truth. He's more concerned with speaking the truth because the truth can change people's lives. Right? And it can take them off that broad path. Yes. Okay. So now, let's just try and connect this, right? It's like you know that people are lemmings. You know that people will be affected by peer pressure. You know that people, the unregenerate. Now, we, there's no excuse for us, all right, the saved. But the people in the world, they'll follow peer pressure. They'll follow the wrong thing. So now we go to Matthew 7, 15. And I'm going to read all the way from 15 to 20. Okay. When Jesus said, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. That is such an important, important scripture. It's incredibly important. But again, it's not, it doesn't stand alone. No. Bear in mind that just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Jesus saying, judge not lest you be judged. Right. Okay, that doesn't mean, because false prophets will come along, and the first thing they'll say, when you say, well, wait a minute, something sounds wrong, they'll say, oh, you're being judgmental. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Satan tried to use the Word of God against God yes. in the wilderness, right? Yes, Don't think that he can't do that because he'll take it out of context. Oh, you know, he'll wrongly divide the Word of God. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and said, you know, we're to show ourselves approved, study to show ourselves approved, be diligent to show ourselves approved unto God. And that's why we need to be in the Word to know it so that Absolutely. when it is taken out of context, but, right, you would understand because, it. Because he warned him, yeah. saying, you know, as workmen, not needing to be ashamed, rightly right. dividing the word of truth. And that's the danger in taking a verse here out of context. Or, you know, you've got to have that whole word in your heart. And you're supposed to write that word of God on the tablets of your heart. Right? So, listen, you are to test. Yes. You are to examine. You right? are to judge. Well, Paul, Paul says, writing to the Corinthians, he said, when I wrote to you, not to associate with immoral people, he said, I didn't mean the people out in the world, because then you, you had to pop out of the world, right? But he said, I did mean inside the church. So-called brothers. So when it comes, and there are warnings and warnings and warnings about these wolves in sheep's clothing, these false prophets. And particularly, like if you go to Matthew 24, when the apostles came to Jesus, and said, you know, tell us, what will be the signs of your coming in the end of the age? And he said, one of the things he said, that, you know, beware, there are going to be many false prophets. Many false prophets. prophets are people who claim to speak from God. They have insight from God. They have knowledge from God that you don't have. 
They speak things that you don't know of, right? That's right. All right. We're talking about lemmings. We're talking about multitudes. We're talking about the masses of people. And the danger is that we have to be this minority, right? Paul wrote to Timothy, again, 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is verse 3. He said, for the time will come. Now, he's talking about the last days, by the way. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in, according, in accordance to their own desires. Okay? People are going to tickle their ears. People, these are teachers, prophets. People that claim to speak for God, to reveal things from God. And they teach according to people's desires. Their fleshly desires, right? When, who, who's the we that Paul is talking about? Or the they, rather. He, when he says that they will not endure well, if you, if you look in the third chapter, he says he's talking about the majority of mankind in general. Those who are following the broad and easy path. Right. Which leads, of course, to destruction. Right? Specifically, he's talking about those, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, who are holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. So, with these false prophets, you've got to beware of them. You've got to avoid them. Unless, of course, God has put you in a position where you go out and you're supposed to bonk these wolves over. Then let, me, let me say something. When you find a brother in error, okay, and we all make mistakes, we all, that's the fact. If you find a brother in error, there's only two possible options working here. When I say a brother in error, you, when you find somebody who is misspeaking, mm -hmm. all right, he is either a brother in error, who needs to be gently corrected, and you correct them with the Word of God, because the, the, right back there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says all Scripture is profitable for, for reproof, for teaching, for, for training in righteousness, for correction, right? Or, if he's not that brother in, who is, needs to be corrected, then he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Wolves in sheep's clothing don't need to be gently corrected. No, they need to be bonked on the head and driven away from the flock. That's right. That was the job of a shepherd. Drive them away from the flock. Protect the flock from these people. That's right. And what's happened today is because people don't understand Jesus' teaching in that first part of the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they'll say, oh, you're being judgmental. Right. right. And the sheeps are welcome, the wolves in sheep's clothing are welcomed in because we don't want to be judgmental about it. Pastor, be judgmental. Absolutely. Test the spirits. Many false prophets have gone abroad. That's a, a great responsibility. Of course it's a great responsibility. And one of the reasons that it says let not many of you become teachers, for by this you incur a stricter judgment. It's a great responsibility. Alright. Jesus, I mentioned, you know, in Matthew 24, the apostles come to Jesus and they say, you know, what are the signs of your coming in the end of the age? Mm -hmm. And he said, at that time, and he's talking about the last days. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Okay? Many. Yes, many. We're back to the many. Mm -hmm. When you talk about leading, you know, it says, one of the most beautiful verses to me in Scripture, or set of verses, is, of course, Psalm 23, which everybody knows. And, and the promise of the Lord is that He will lead us and, and guide us in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He leads us in paths of righteousness. Mm -hmm. That's that narrow way. Alright? That leads to life. Satan wants to lead you away from there. And what, what does he offer you? A broad, easy. You know, um, we just came back recently from London. And we were staying down in New Addington on the south side of London. And when we leave here in the old Manchester area, we follow broad, wide motorways all the way down to London. And we went down on the uh, M25, uh, which is called the London Orbital. Orbital. I can I can talk. Which goes around London, and we had to get off the M25 and drive to New Addington. And the road there is quite interesting. Yes. Quite interesting. It is narrow. It's wide enough for one vehicle. Of course, it's two-way. Yes, it's two lanes. And I don't think you can go five feet without a curve, blind curve. I mean, mm. it's, just, it's like a little serpentine. 
and it goes on for quite some distance. Yeah, yes, yes. And and that's the only way to get from the M20. It's not the only way. It's the most direct way to get from the M25 to New Addington, where we were going to stay. Um, when we came back, I chose to go another way because it, it, the way was easier, the way was broader. It seemed like it was less dangerous. Yeah. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Tell your Tom Tom or your satin or your. You don't always yeah. need the narrow road there. No. But it, that, that may be true driving from the M25 to New Addington if you're doing that in the near future. But it's not true spiritually. Right. Even though it may look more dangerous, even though it may be more challenging, it is that, it is that narrow road that leads to life. But you want to know something. When the scripture says, be on the alert for your adversary, goes the, about as a wrong line. line. When you're on that narrow road, you are alert. Oh, yeah, when you're that's on that true. broad yeah. and, and wide, easy road, you're not quite as alert. That's a, that's a good point, Alice. It really is, because it's true. You get on these great big motorways, and it's, you, know, you can just kind of cruise along, yeah, and right. you can put you your brain off, into that's it. Exactly right. Right. But if you're on that little twisty road, bro, you've you got to be alert all the time. Absolutely. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, so, so be on the alert, right? Be on the alert, right. okay. yes. John wrote in his first letter, 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many, many false prophets. It's not like, okay, there's maybe an occasional one here. Many. Many false prophets. Well, have gone. you just turn on the television. There are many false prophets. Well, how do you know? By testing them. By testing them. Oh, we're not supposed to judge. Yes, you are. You are commanded by the yes. Word of God to test. Amen, amen. Now, when we do this, I'm not saying, okay, that person's going to hell, this person's going to heaven. No, I'm not saying that. No, no. What I am saying is, we are to test the prophets. And that is a command of God all the way through Scripture. I promise you that the Scripture, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Law and the Prophets, the New Testament, is filled with with instruction that we are to test these these spirits. Yes. Because always there have been many false prophets. Right. There have always been. Always. And they have always been the enemy of the Word of God. Amen. They have always been the enemy of the people of God. You know why? Because they are the enemy of God. God. That's right. Okay. So how do you test them? Well, Jesus said, Hello, we got instruction. You shall know them by their fruits. So let's do that. Okay. okay. We're going to talk about just a couple. Because I just want to get you started on this. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Um, the first fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, right, mm -hmm. is love. Yes. So if you're going to test a, somebody that claims to be a prophet, somebody that claims to be speaking for the Lord, if you're going to test them, there needs to be visible love in their lives. The question is, do they love you, or themselves. do they love the Lord, enough, now you can tell, do they love you enough to tell you the truth? truth. That's right. Now, watch out now, because does that prophet you're listening to love you enough? Remember, God disciplines those whom He loves. Mm -hmm. Does that person you're listening to love you enough? to expose your sin rather than tickle your ears. Listen to Lamentations chapter 2 four, verse 14. Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. You get that? The prophets, they, they're giving you false and foolish visions. They haven't exposed your iniquity. What do you mean exposed my iniquity? That's judging. No. Because that's what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. We are supposed to do that in love. Speaking the truth in love, right? Mm -hmm. it, Jesus said it too. Imagine if you see your you brother sin, sin, you go to him. You go to him, all right? Why? The purpose of exposing sin 
is to restore you from captivity. Jesus Christ said, if you sin, you are a slave to sin. Bondage. You're a slave to sin. No man can serve two masters. If you are enslaved to sin, you are unable to serve God because you can't serve two masters. It's impossible. The purpose of the prophets is to break that bondage of sin in your life. Yes. Not to come along and promise you the newest car, the better job, new love in your life, mm -hmm. which is what tickles the ears and tickles the flesh that people all love to hear so very much. Love. Love of God, who is the truth, Love of you who will come to you, get in your face, and I've been saying this for years. We are living, we are blessed to live in exciting times. We are blessed to live in dangerous times. You need good fellowship. I need good fellowship. We need the kind of fellowship to be around people who will love you enough that when they see you doing wrong, they will get in your face, speak the truth in love, grab you by your spiritual collar, and pull you away from that sin. It says when two, two are better than one for their labor, when one falls, the other one's there to reach down and lift them up. You know what? You were lifted up. It says that God lifted you up out of the pit, out of the miry clay, and set your feet upon a rock. He reached down and he grabbed you and he yanked you out of that pit. Amen. Amen. You know what it just made me think of? Is somebody, if you saw somebody in danger, was it, they were standing in a, a, maybe a, a car or something was going to hit them, you wouldn't, you would just run over and you'd push that person out of the way of, or yeah. out of the danger. Now, uh, their first reaction would be to be angry with you. Why did you push me? Right. And That's then when flesh. they, yeah, and then when they right. realized what you were doing or what danger they were in, then they're thankful for yes. it. Well, How's and I were talking about this this morning because I deserved it, and uh, I've, I've said this before. <clears throat> let me let me say this first of all: false promises and sympathy will never heal anybody's never, spiritual problem. Never, never, okay? No, no. It'll never heal your spiritual ailment. But our flesh, my flesh, I want the poor babies. If I'm not feeling good, I want Alice Moe to say, oh, poor baby. Sympathy. Job had sympathizers. A lot of good that did. Yeah, right. Then along came Elihu. Bam! Hit him with the Word of God. And that prepared him to hear from God. When he heard from God, everything changed. You need to hear from God for things to change. That's what a prophet does. He brings you the word of God. All right? Sympathy isn't going to cure anything. False promises won't cure anything. It is the word of God. It is that love. That is that word of love spoken in, in love. That word of truth spoken in love. Regardless of how, how it hurts your flesh. Oh, say poor baby. You don't need poor baby. You need rise and be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. You need somebody to come along and grab you and pull you out of that place. <clears throat> you know, we talked about this, I think, last week, maybe the week before. The flesh and the spirit are in a fight, a battle to the death. Yes. To the death. To the death. Because if Why your flesh is alive, die? it will choke your spirit to death. Yes, it will. And if your spirit is alive, it will cause you to deny all the lusts of the flesh. And, the, and that flesh will wither away. And that, when I'm talking, I'm not talking about your body, I'm talking about that old, fallen human nature. nature. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a man, Paul talked about, I don't know if I'm going to the whole thing, but he, he talked about the fact that when this man sinned and refused to be corrected, you know what it says? Paul said, I turned him over to the devil, the devil. That's right. for the destruction of his flesh. Amen. That's what the Word of God says. Mm -hmm. Because until his flesh would be destroyed, he'll not have spiritual life. We have to be able to say like Paul, because that's what he said. We can say, we have died and our life is hidden with Christ Jesus. Until that flesh dies, it will be there, chewing away, clawing away, smacking away your spirit constantly. So how do you do that? How do you turn them over to the devil? Well, I, I think... How do turn their flesh over to he, the devil? He was talking about excommunication. He was talking about cutting them off from fellowship. Right. Sending them out into the world. Because the world, it says, you know, is in the power of the evil one. That's what John wrote in his letter. We know that this, this present world is in the power of the evil one. And it's not trying to correct them and... and well, know. there was a trying before that. Right, I mean, right. You know, Afterwards, right. I mean, you, you yes. get to the point where there's nothing more you can say to them. Is that almost like the pearls before swine? 
Well, yes, it is like the pearls before swine. Which we still Which about. again, it's all connected. connected. Because, you know, it's um, Jesus in Matthew 18. This is, it's all connected. When he says, if you see your brother sin, go to him and him alone. You deal with him. You bring him that word of correction that's in love. That's it. And if he doesn't respond to that, and that's, by the way, when I say brother, I'm talking about you cisterns, too. Amen. Yeah. Um, We're all in yes, love. Yes, yes. So, but if he doesn't respond to that, then you get somebody else and you go back. And, you, and if he doesn't respond to that, then you bring it before the church. And if he doesn't respond to that, what, you know what we need to do? We need to cut him off from fellowship. Right. Not because we hate him, no. not because we don't love him, but because we do love him. And God disciplines those whom he loves. Paul cut this man off, sent him out from fellowship for the destruction of his flesh. Because that's what Paul knew it would take for his spirit to live. And that's what matters. That's a hard thing. I know it's a hard thing. We need hard things. The soft pampering will, will encourage you. It will push you towards that wide, broad, easy road that leads to destruction. Okay. False promises, sympathy, watch out for them. You know, and, and flatterer. Oh, Double watch out for flatterers. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many times in Scripture it talks about watch out for flatterers. Flattery. And flattery, it's not just saying something nice to somebody. Yeah, something it's nice, it's not real. It's, it's you know, it's it, untruth. Well, it's not. It doesn't even have to be untrue. It's just they're saying it to gain advantage. You know, it's it's oh, a motivation. It's a self. It, it can be a lie or it can be a truth, but it's spoken for their advantage mm -hmm. somehow, right? Mm -hmm. All right? Let me just go on before we do run out of time, and it's. Um, the other, the second fruit of the spirit, of course, is joy. Mm. So, does the joy that these prophets claim to have and claim to bring, the joy that they preach, does it come from a relationship with the Lord, having His Word, or does their joy and the joy they promise you come from having the stuff of the world? I want you to know where joy is supposed to come from. It doesn't come from a new job, a new house, a new. No. You know where it comes from? Just listen to these. Okay. This is the Gospel of John, John three. I'm going to read verses 29 and 30. This is John the Baptist speaking. He said, He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bride, bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. John the Baptist said his joy was made full because he heard the voice of Jesus Christ. All right? God wants to give you gifts. We said before, last week I think it was, we talked about seek, knock, ask, right? You'll find God wants to give. The fruit of love is giving. The expression of love is giving. For God so loved the world he gave. But let me read you this verse. This is from Jesus praying in the garden in John 17. God, this is Jesus praying to his Father. He said, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word. Mm -hmm. Jesus said that our joy should be made full in ourselves because we have heard him, we have been given his word. Jeremiah, I think I quoted this, I did quote it at the very beginning, yes, Jeremiah right. 15. Jeremiah said, Thy word was found and I ate it. It became for me the joy and the delight of my heart. Amen. The world promises you joy from stuff. False prophets will promise you joy from, from stuff. That's true. True, lasting, everlasting joy, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, comes from God's Word. From a relationship with God, not from stuff. Which is okay? eternal. So, so that's a way to test it. Don't test them. Let me, because we're running out of time here, let me do this. Let me tell you, don't test prophets by how large a following they have and how popular they are. You hear me? That's, this, is, this is the most dangerous thing and the most common things. We test people by how large an audience they have, how popular they are, all right? Yes. Remember, remember the many and the few. And the few. Remember the words of Jesus. He said, you will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. This isn't a popularity contest. Quite the contrary. Jesus said, you know, here's the promise. You'll be hated. Show me the prophets of old who were not hated.
by the by the by the church, yes, by the people of God. Show them to me. Was it Ezekiel? Was it Jeremiah? Was it Amos? These people were hated because they brought the word of God. When did it change? When did God throw the switch that changed all of that? You're right, he didn't. <laughs> if the world hates you, Jesus said, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. The things that we look at, and I hear people point, oh, look at this guy, he's about 800 million people following him. He's got this most beautiful smile. That's not the test of a prophet, my friend. That's not the test of a prophet, my brother or sister. That is a dangerous road to, that can lead to destruction. That's right. The popularity may be very well be a test to reveal false prophets. They've always been popular. Yes. Well, it's true. Amen. Right. I call this the McDonald's syndrome. I can remember. I'm old enough to remember. I'm old enough to remember. Yes, me too. When under the arches there was a sign, one million sold. Yeah, I remember that. Well, it got to be over one billion sold. I mean, it got to be. I can remember when the sign went up, one billion yeah. sold. Now it's over a billion sold. They still put even put the signs up. You know why? Because they knew something. It's not just the fact they they touted their popularity. Yes. You know why? Because people are lemmings. Yes. They like follow. to go and follow what other people are doing. Right. If you know, there's an expression: fifty thousand Frenchmen can't be wrong, can they? You bet you they can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's following the masses. It's being a lemming. It goes back to that. You know, we we like to be in the in crowd. Success. Listen, I'm going to tell you. I've been, a, I've been a management consultant, a business consultant, I was for many, many years. I know the truth of this in the world. Success breeds success. Mm -hmm. People are drawn That's to right. success. They want to be like it. It's a lie. That's not what breeds success. The Word of God tells you what breeds success is being faithful to God's Word. Yeah. Read Joshua chapter yes. 1. Yeah. Read Psalm chapter 1. Yes. And you will see that success comes as a result of a right relationship with God the Father. Not being popular or following what is popular. Amen. Okay. I was involved as a pastor in New York back in the 70s mm -hmm. with a group, a very, very well-known group of a multi-marketing, multimedia, multi-level marketing plan. Yes. I wasn't involved in it. But people were coming to my church work. Coming to the Bible study. And yes. and so many of these people, they were coming and they'd drive up in their Cadillacs and Always with their fancy Cadillac. suits and and you know what? They were in debt up over their heads to have these things. Mm. But they were told over and over and over, you gotta look successful. You got so people will be drawn to you. John the Baptist didn't look that way. No. And I promise you, Jesus Christ did not look that way right. when he was on that cross. And yet he had said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. In Isaiah 53, it says that he had no appearance that men should be attracted to him. He didn't have pretty clothes. He didn't have a pretty television show. He didn't have a pretty smile. He was beaten and battered for our sake, for our sins. And yet, it is that word of the cross that is the power of God unto salvation, Paul says. When he is lifted up, he will draw men to him. Do not be deceived by that liar, that father of lies. Mm. Grab onto the cloak of him who is the truth, who is the way, and follow him Amen. with all of your heart. Well, for certain, everything, including the false prophets, will be revealed at the end. Yes, they will. <clears throat> Which now connects us to where we will start next week. I'm just going to tell you, in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Don't miss next week's teaching. I promise you, it may be one of the most important things that you ever hear. And I, I don't say that boastfully. I am saying that because I understand what God has spoken, what the Father has spoken through Jesus Christ here. And it is simply one of the most important things that we can know, those of us who are the saved, the elect, the chosen of God, those of us who have accepted that atoning work of Jesus Christ. Until then, may the Lord our God just bless you to this. Jesus loves you. Amen. Only by
to me.